This is not exactly what we've been told, or at least what we've been led to believe in our society. I mean, on one hand, this somehow resonates true, but we are led to believe that most of these lower emotions are useful. They are stimulating and educational. Now, for example, shame. Maybe when you were a kid, you misbehaved. You did something your mother didn't approve. And then she told you, shame on you. Now, why would your mother want you to feel shame? It is a terrible, terrible feeling, terrible emotion, terrible vibration. Because she thought that if you connect in your mind your misdeed with that terrible, terrible feeling, terrible sensation, you will never do this again. So, you will learn your lesson. So, shame is considered to be an educational tool. How about guilt? Being never good enough, or at least thinking that you are not good enough. It is motivating, because it's, if, you, if you are not good enough, you are going to do everything in your power, everything that you can, to somehow better yourself, to make self-improvement. But, you know, the problem with that is that we are confusing humiliation with humility. Now, humility is a great educational tool and motivational. And humility comes from upper part of, the, of the, this map. The difference between humiliation and humility is in forgiveness and acceptance. Because in humiliation, you are never good enough and you never will be. And you feel guilty because you are not good enough. And that drains your energy. True humility includes self-acceptance. So, yes, I'm not good enough and I'll keep working on that. But in the meantime, I accept myself as I am. And I forgive myself for not being better. And trust me, it is a much, much better vibration for any kind of improvement. Just this, this vibration is masochistic. And you can never get out of that, because you constantly worry about perfection, and that's not going to happen. You will never, ever be perfect. I'm sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> but you will always be on a road to improvement, if you wish so. Okay. Okay, apathy is not exactly considered to be an Useful, that's great. Grief may be uh, confused with uh, compassion, because if you all the time are sad and think because you are thinking about poor kids that are starving somewhere or animals that are, be are being abused, that can be perceived as compassionate, but it is not. Because in that state, you won't do anything about that. So, what's the use? Okay. Fear. Oh. In our society, fear, also called anxiety, also called stress, that's great. You know, you need some stress in your life because somehow it will motivate you and propel you to do more and better and faster and so on and so on. And to a certain extent, that, that's true. Because what fear will do, it will bring some adrenaline in your system and it will give you an extra boost but at a great, great price. Because our body is not designed to be in a state of stress and fear for a prolonged periods of time. It's designed to be under stress for 10 or 15 minutes and it will give, your adrenaline in your body will give you enough boost to run away from hungry animal. But if you are in, under stress or in fear for weeks or even months, it will take a toll on your health and you will crash sooner or later. Maybe after a few days, maybe after a few years, but you will crash. And you will crash here to apathy or at least you will interpret that exhaustion as despair and apathy and then even you, you will fall down to guilt because you are not even able to handle a little stress. And all your colleagues in the workplace are under stress. And nobody is complaining, and you are complaining. You can't even handle that shame on you. <laughs> Everybody will laugh at you. 
because you can't handle a little bit of stress. Okay. So, fear is also considered to be motivational under certain circumstances and to, the, to a certain extent. Desire. Desire is great. Because you need to be in a state of desire. In a state of desire, you want more of everything. More money, you want better car, you want bigger house, and that will help economy. Because, you know, insatiable desires create consumption. And we even measure success, economic success of a country through GDP. It is, it is a measure of how much money were spent. And so, desire contributes to overall wealth. I mean, that's just common wisdom. As, and now, as you see, when you take a look at all this, you will see that our conventional wisdom is not that very wise. <laughs> and, of course, anger. Anger has a lot of energy. And when you say, this is not fair, we should change this, we should make a revolution, <laughs> or whatever, we should organize a union in our company, everyone will say, you go, girl! <laughs> That's great, you have a lot of energy and something needs to be done, and you go and get it. So, anger is also perceived sometimes as good. And, of course, sometimes it will be perceived by, for example, your colleagues as a something that should be encouraged because now you will motivate others to do more because you will go around and say why are you not working enough now you should finish this until noon and so on and so on so anger is also sometimes encouraged and pride pride is for most people uh, seen as a goal when you invest a lot of energy, a lot of time, a lot of effort into whatever that you wish. Creating a product or building a family or a house or whatever it is that you perceive as some kind of goal, then you will be in a state of pride rightfully because you deserve it. And sure, pride feels much better than shame and guilt. But it is volatile and it is a position that needs to be defended because it is about you being better than the others. So, it is about comparing yourself and if you compare yourself, then it, it means that your happiness is somehow dependent on other people and external circumstances. And that's not good. And you will fail sooner or later in something. And if you are in a state of pride, that usually means that you will fall to guilt and shame. Because I should have known better. I should have been smarter. And now everyone will laugh at me. Okay, so our conventional wisdom, our common wisdom, is based on a well, assumption that road to success is pain, and suffering. And what we are talking about here, what we are trying to <laughs> present you as an idea, we are not trying to convince you. Just examine, just stay open to all this and see what resonates. We are not going to try to convince you in any way. But just stay open to it and maybe, just maybe, it is not that success is created by pain and suffering. Maybe success comes from being happy and understanding and forgiving because it will integrate you with your environment. All those emotions and vibratory states will separate you. I mean, nobody likes arrogant people. Nobody likes angry people. You don't like to be around people who are in constant fear, who are twitching at every sound. You don't like people who are in apathy. I mean, they are very, very heavy, heavy. And guilt and shame. So, these all emotions will separate you from other people. These will integrate you. And it all begins with attitude. I can do that. 
I can do that. That's courage. I mean, I don't still know how, but somehow everything will be fine. I can do whatever the situation requires of me. So these are separating you from the other people. These are integrated, integrating you with the environment and therefore you will be able from here to use other people's experiences and knowledge and to cooperate. Cooperation is much, much more efficient than competition. And it's not only about you in relations to everything else, it's about you being inside the community, contributing, not being better and separated and being in a constant fear and desire, but being somehow part of a larger picture. And when you are part of a larger picture, you are contributing your vibration to everyone else. Okay, now this is uh, another part of our story and it is extremely important. Now it's time to address one small detail that we somehow so far managed to avoid. <laughs> and this is this number. Now you probably assumed, rightfully and correctly, that this number is some kind of, some kind of power. And it is. But, and this is the real kicker, this scale is not linear. It is logarithmic. Meaning that power with each level rises exponentially. Exponentially. Positive emotions, positive vibratory state, have much, much, much bigger influence on society in general than those lower. Because they are a kind of viral. Because if I'm happy, then I will probably, just by being in a certain environment, contribute to other people's happiness. It's contagious. Happiness is contagious. Optimism is contagious. And it is much faster and much more powerful than certain contagion that comes from those lower states. I mean, uh, just l let me explain this this way. You can be in a bad mood all day. And then one good belly laugh of 30 seconds will wipe that slate clean. You will be happy. It doesn't work that way in another direction. If you are happy and enjoy and full of understanding and serenity and forgiveness, it will be pretty difficult to pull you down in a state of fear or anger. It will take a lot of time and a lot of people <laughs> convincing you that you should be afraid. <laughs> if you are here in understanding. However, if you are afraid, then one person can, can give you through his vibration and inspiration, and however you wish to call it, ideas, really creative, innovative ideas that come from these upper states. Inspiration, so, well, give you a boost pretty quickly. So, to put this in the context, just let me consult my outside memory bank. <laughs> okay. For example, we already talked about this threshold. This threshold is where negative emotions become positive. Negative vibration become positive. And it is very, very important on a personal level to cross this threshold. And this is a threshold where problems become challenges. Do you understand the difference be between problem and the challenge? Can you feel that in you? When you say, I have a problem, that you somehow feel heavier and somehow you don't feel inspired to address that issue. But if you say, for the very same thing, I have a challenge, somehow it lifts you up. 
Just by defining something as a problem or as a challenge makes huge difference. And this threshold here is where problems become challenges. And all becomes with courage and with vibrational attitude that says, I can do it. Okay. And then from that point forward, these are all more and more positive and more and more influential ex exponentially. So, it's very important for you personally to cross this threshold and then somehow the process becomes exponential for you too. Uh, the higher you go, the faster you go. Let me put it that way. But also, it is extremely important for society at large to cross this threshold. Because when uh, society at large crosses this threshold, it becomes less egoistic. People start to cooperate, people start to pull their resources together to contribute to the common good and things start accelerating in a positive way very, very quickly. And it is much, much more powerful than you would expect. For example, one person at level of 700 compensates for 70 million people that are under this threshold. So if you have a society that's under the threshold of well, courage and just one person at a really high level of enlightenment or peace, he or she can compensate for 70 million people below the threshold. And if that seems impossible, just think of Gandhi. One man, actually quite small and skinny, just by being on a higher consciousness level, actually helped defeat an empire. One person at a level of 600 compensates for 10 million individuals below 200. One at 500 compensates for 750,000 and one person at 300 compensates for 90,000 individuals below 200. And our planet right now is barely above this threshold, barely, because more than 85% of people on our planet live below this line. And actually there are countries and regions in the world where apathy is dominant vibratory state, uh, extreme poverty, and, and, nothing, and people believe that there is nothing that they can do to make their situation better and so on and so on. So, 85% of people right now in the world is below the critical threshold and only 4% on the level of 500 and more. But, each one of those that are above are compensating for 750,000 individuals. And if they are on 600, they are compensating for 10 million and 700, 70 million people. So, Positive vibratory states are much, much, much more powerful than negative ones and that's really great news. Because when you lift your personal vibration just from maybe 310 to 320, you are doing huge service to your country, to your town, to your continent and to the planet at large. Being in a high vibration, being happy and forgiving and optimistic is the most selfless thing that you can do. It is not selfish. You are helping a lot by rising your vibratory level a few points. Even if you are here, of course. That contributes too. And 
society at large changes dramatically when it crosses this, this threshold, actually it changes dramatically with each and every point <laughs> that it is uh, lifted during time. So, for example, when society at large is on the level of consciousness below 50, rate of unemployment is 97%, rate of poverty is 65%, I mean on average, right? And rate of criminality is 98%. So, when society is somewhere here and guilt, shame, apathy. But, when, even below threshold of 200, when society is between 100 and 200, rate of unemployment falls to 50%, and rate of criminality is also 50%, and rate of poverty is 22%. So, we are rising our level from 50 to, let's say, 150, and it's huge, huge improvement. When you cross the threshold of 200, rate of unemployment falls to 8%, rate of criminality to 9%. And for a society at large that's between 400 and 500, there are a few places in the world that collective level of consciousness is at that rate, but there are. Rate of unemployment is about 2%, rate of criminality is about 2 and rate of poverty is 0.5%. So, being in a high vibration is not selfish. But of course, now you will say, you know what, I'm not that convinced. That sounds a little bit fishy to me. Are you really saying that one person at the level of, let's say, 350, will be able to lift an entire community of 90,000 people out of their misery, out of the lower emotional states, just by what? Being there, radiating his happy frequency around. <laughs> I'm not that convinced. That's not how things work. Well, yes and no. It's not just about being in the right vibration. It's about doing things, taking actions that are compatible with that particular level of consciousness or vibration or frequency. That will be a real life changer. Let me give you an example. Let's say there is a small town, a little bit isolated, maybe one hour drive from the closest bigger town. And it's uh, in the middle of some forest woods. And for years and years, Life was beautiful, everyone was happy, and the main source of income for the most residents there, it was a local, let's, uh, let's say, sawmill, because there are a lot of woods, they produced furniture and, you know, wood for floors or something like that. But 10 years ago, for whatever reason, that business went bankrupt, went bust, and a lot of people lost their jobs. Of course, government promised to help, but never did. <laughs> and, you know, bit by bit, that community uh, landed into the collective apathy. Because, you know, situation is hopeless. No other businesses came here to replace that jobs that were lost and uh, young people are leaving because they don't see their future there and older people just don't know what to do and every, everything is just, you know, stuck. So, there is a lot of hopelessness and despair and, you know, apathy. Also, there is a lot of grief because people are remembering these golden old days. Oh, how we were happy 15 years ago. Do you remember that? And they are comparing their current situation with sometimes long lost. And they have a sadness, you know, because, oh, things are terrible. And where will my son ever find a job in this place? He will probably have to leave me go to another city and I will see him once a month and that's also sad. Also, there is a lot of fear. You know, people are afraid for their existence. Even people who still hold some jobs in the city are afraid. 
So probably, you know, okay, that sawmill was the biggest uh, job creator in the city, but also there is a probably a supermarket, a post office, a local branch of some bank, and people working in that bank, they have a job, but they are terrified that they will lose it, because if they lose their job in a bank, if they got fired for whatever reason, if bank closes their branch, they will not be able to find another job anywhere in this city. And they will starve. And they are afraid. Of course, there is a lot of desire, because people want things. They, they would like a better car. They would like to go on vacation somewhere, to travel maybe a little bit. And since they cannot do that, they are angry. There is a lot of anger. But, you know, the city is somewhere here. Collective vibration, collective field that the residents are creating resonates somewhere here. And probably on the level of apathy more than on the level of anger. But all those vibrations are in. And actually, since all those vibrations are not extremely constructive, actually, they are not constructive at all, <laughs> nobody is doing anything to create new jobs or to solve any kind of problem. And that problem creates more problems that resonate with apathy and fear and desire. For example, there is a lot of corruption and there is a lot of nepotism. I mean, why? Well, let's say that you are somehow elected as a mayor of that small town and people expect you to do some change, to make better future for themselves. But you have no idea how to do it. Why? Because you are here. Because you are in apathy. Or maybe if you are in a mayor, maybe you have some pride, but also a lot of fear because people will notice that you are faker and so there is some shame too. And of course guilt, because you are not doing the job that you were supposed to do. Why? Because you have no idea. <laughs> where to start. So, you have no access to inspiration and to real creativity that reside from here upwards. And therefore, you will take any opportunity to have some extra money. If someone wants something from the city, you will say, yeah, yeah, but pay me first. Because you know that you are not going to be re-elected. And now you are going to, you know, create some retirement fund. And since your brother and your wife and your son and your neighbor are also equally not able to find a job in the city, you are going to make them a kind of favor and employ them in your mayor's office. So there will be a lot of nepotism. And of course it will be. If you really try to understand that point of view, it's obvious. Okay? So, we have a city that's full of anger and desire and fear and grief and apathy. And nothing changes for years. And then, one day, someone, one person, from the level of acceptance, comes to the city and says, huge opportunity. Because there is a lot of wood, beautiful forests around. And sure, solve mill may, obviously is not a good idea. It went bankrupt for whatever reason. But maybe we can make a paper factory. Why not? And what are you going to do? First, you are going to visit mayor's office. And you will say, you know, I really would like to create a plant, a factory for paper. And I'm going to employ, let's say, 1,000 people. So do I need some permit? <laughs> Mayor will say, yeah, sure, you need a permit. And, but first, you need to pay me first. Now, you choose not to be angry. You choose to understand and to forgive. And then you say, you know, I have a better idea. How about this? You give me a permit and I will build a factory. And I will say to everyone that that would be impossible without your help. So, without your help, 
there wouldn't be thousand new jobs. That will really give some credibility to you. And you are probably going to be re-elected because no one else is doing anything for this town. And now you are. You are creating jobs. That's great. You know, something is finally moving. So he gives you the permit because four more years on government salary is probably better than, you know, that bribe that he asked you. Okay? And then you're going to build a factory. And of course, now it's time to hire some people. And you may say that would be a typical comment from the level of desire and pride. You know what? These people are not working for years. And they are desperate. And they are hopeless. And they are going to work for half of the regular salary. Or maybe even less. How about we pay them as little as we possibly can? Because they have no choice. Ha ha ha. But since you understand, since you know that what's good for you is good for me, you're not going to do that. You are going to offer them a fair salary, you know, fair price for their involvement in your project, in your paper factory. But then you will see that all of them are ready and willing to do a job, but not all of them are able because they don't know how to do certain tasks that you asked them to do. Maybe they don't know how to sell, how to promote, how to do advertising, marketing, whatever it is. Okay? And sure, you can fire them and look for another people to fill that positions. But how about some education? Because when you educate your employees, when you show them how to do job properly, you will have much, much less employee turnover, as it is popularly or officially uh, called. So, if really people are happy and they know that the, their workplace, their company is supporting them and it will help them grow and learn and they will be paid fairly. They will not going to leave you. I mean, of course, some of them will for some, for whatever reason, from time to time, but they won't leave in spades. So, because from this level, from desire or from pride, people are stupid and they are replaceable and we'll pay them as little as we can. Because, you know, it's not our problem. But it is. It is. Because each time someone leaves his post, his place in a factory, and you replace him with someone else, now you need to educate and integrate that new person. So, actually, employee turnover is a very expensive thing. You want to avoid that. How? by being kind to people who are already working for you and who are loyal to you and who are looking for some guidance. So you are going to educate them. But then you will realize that some of your employees are constantly tired, exhausted. And, you know, the irony is that most tired people are people from maybe 25 to 40 years old. I mean, how come? How is that possible? Then you will realize that these people have kids at home that should go to kindergarten or maybe to elementary school. And since there is no elementary school in town anymore, it closed five years ago, now they need every morning to drive their kids to school one hour by car to the next city and then come back course. So, if they want to be in a factory by 9, they leave their home at 7 o'clock. And they are tired. You say, you know, it's not very good for business, for me, that they are suffering. Because what's good to, for them is good for me. How about we open an elementary school here? I mean, what, what do we need? We need one building and one school teacher. Okay? I'll take care of building and I'll call my friend Mayer and say, I have another idea. How can you be even more popular? How about we open 
a little elementary school or kindergarten. Okay? I will somehow provide a building and you take care of the school teacher on a government salary, for example. And then you will find out that there is a huge problem with injuries and sickness because since there is no hospital anymore in the city, not even an ambulance, maybe some you know, emergency room, but if someone has a flu, he needs to go to the next city, one hour there, one hour back. Actually, for a common cold, people are taking their three days sickness leave. Huh? And that's not good for business. We are spending too much time treating minor injuries and uh, you know, routine sicknesses like flu and cold or something like that. So how about opening a little ambulance? Just one doctor. Just one doctor to handle these routine things because we are losing too much time going back and forth to the nearest hospitals. And then, bit by bit, yeah, by acting from the forgiveness and understanding and optimism and trust, that optimism becomes contagious. Because, for example, that guy that worked in a bank, or still works in a bank, terrified that he will lose his job. He's not that terrified anymore, because he knows that if he somehow gets fired from the bank, he can always come to work for you. And there is trust that you will somehow accept him. And there is optimism. And suddenly, not only your factory, but also all the businesses in the whole city, like barbershop, like a supermarket, like a massage salon, suddenly they have more business, they have more clients, people have more money, people are finally getting more money, getting paid fairly, and they're spending it to other services. And so, and so you know, what once was a community between apathy and anger suddenly crosses this threshold of courage. And your example of creating a thousand or five hundred new jobs in a community that was practically dying becomes a shining example for all the little villages around. Because maybe we started with a city of 20 or 30,000 people. And of course, if you employ 1,000 people, it's not going to employ, it's to solve all problems. But suddenly, people who have had another, different ideas, maybe they want to create a, a repair shop for cars. Suddenly they have optimism, they trust that their business is going to work because now people have more money, now people are more driving their cars and so on and so on. And complete city with surrounding villages and maybe even another city will talk about, you know, that city one hour drive for us, it was dying. But now, somehow it's fresh, somehow it's better. You know, people are optimistic, people start, are starting to smile, and so on and so on. It's contagious. It's contagious and it's beautiful. So, in a way, we got it backwards in our society, in our culture, especially Western culture. It is common sense, let's say, that road to success is through pain and suffering. It's actually not. It's not. This is a way of the force, but real power is here. Because let me tell you one thing more. Once that threshold of courage was lifted for the entire community. Once your employees are happy and their families are happy and they are not living in fear and in grief and in apathy anymore, they will come with creative and innovative ideas how to expand your business. And someone will, someone will tell you probably, 
You know what we should do? We should produce notebooks, not just pieces of paper. And maybe we can set up a printing shop and do some, I don't know, flyers or books or print anything that people need because because it's, uh, you know, common sense. We are producing paper and then we are selling that paper to other companies that print something and then, you know, why not do that? And then you're going to employ 100 more people. And it is not going to be necessarily your idea. Best ideas will come from your employees, but only if they are creative. If they are living in fear, they are not creative. If they are in apathy, even if some great idea comes to their mind, which is highly unlikely, but even if they have some brilliant idea at some point in their life, they're just going to shrug and, ah, you know, yeah, that would be great, but there's nothing to be done there. You want people to be creative. You want everyone to be happy. If you are happy and acting on that from the compatible with that level of consciousness, then you will allow other people to do the same. And that's great. What's good for you is good for me. What's good for me is good for you. What's good for everyone is good for me. What's good for me is good for everyone. You know, it, there is no win-lose situation. It is a win-win. It is always win-win. Actually, it's a win-win-win-win-win-win-win-win-win. Because what's good for my company is good for my employee, is good for his family, is good for a super local supermarket, is good for barber shop, is good for... And you just can continue that line of reasoning <laughs> however you wish. So you see, one person from the level of free film can really lift, let's say 90,000 people, but you know, that's rule of thumb, that's estimation. And that will create, uh, I mean, rate of unemployment will drop from 50% to 8%. That doesn't mean that you are going to employ all those people. So from 50% to you are going to employ 42%. You don't have to. What you need to do is act or respond to a circumstance in a way that's going to create some trust and optimism. And then situation will improve. Also rate of criminality will fall from 50% to 9%. How is that possible? Because that government official, that mayor that wanted some bribe in the beginning, he doesn't need that anymore. He knows that he will, maybe he will be re-elected, but maybe he won't. It doesn't matter. Because actually what he always wanted to do is to grow some flowers. <laughs> and he will do that. And now he has a market to sell that, those flowers to. Before our factory, he maybe wanted to uh, grow some flowers, but he didn't know, he, he, he thought or he perceived situation in a way that, okay, maybe I will grow thousand roses, but who's going to buy them? Now he has trust and optimism and he's not that afraid that he will die, starve. And he is not going to be that pushy. He doesn't need to. Okay, that's that's really, and of course, his nephew, he will find a job somewhere else because for his nephew that he employed as his assistant, just because he knew that otherwise that nephew will never ever find another job. But now he knows that he will. And maybe it is the highest passion, maybe that nephew really wants to work as a government official. But if not, he can fix cars or washing machines or install internet in people's homes, or whatever, whatever he prefers to do. So that's how it works. Not just by radiating happy freaking, visualizing unicorns in the sky, and somehow that will help solve all our problems. No, 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 no. no. You need to be happy. You need to be on the level of willingness, acceptance, at least neutrality. 
and then act on it. Act on it. Act in a way that is consistent with that vibration and that will lift an entire community up. Okay. If you want to be really successful, first you need to be in a higher levels of consciousness. Or you can look at this side and say you need to be as happy as possible. Because happiness makes us wise and creative. And this is where real intelligent, intelligence lies, in our higher mind, not in our lower mind. This is reactive mind, lower mind. This is higher mind. This is where real creativity comes from, and innovation, and ideas, and compassion, and understanding, and forgiveness, and optimism, and so on, and so on. Okay, so while you are trying to be as happy as possible, to be as successful as possible, you will notice that your definition of success will also change. At first, in the first period, people define their success through what they have. So I am very success successful because I have huge car and house and, uh, you know, a lot of money. This is what I have. Stage two. Success is about what one does. So, sometime, somewhere here, it becomes more important what you do than how much you are paid. So, it is much more interesting or better or more attractive to be a quantum physicist or a surgeon or rocket scientist than you know someone who just has a lot of lot of money so first it's about what one has then it's about what one does but in the end you will understand you will know not just understand that happiness is about what one is or what one has become. Or as Dr. David Hawkins beautifully said, we change the world not by what we say or do, but as a consequence of what we have become. Be the change you want to see in the world. And then you will be successful and happy. Road to success is not through pain and suffering, but through understanding, kindness, forgiveness, optimism. Those beautiful higher vibrations. There, we are not in competition, we are cooperating. What's good for me is good for you. What's good for you is good for me. Okay. So, this is a beautiful theory. But you are probably still wondering, Okay, that somehow makes sense, but how did Dr. David Hawkins come to this solution? And you still didn't tell me what's my vibration. <laughs> and these are all excellent questions.